Um, this is uh, just really exciting to be able to be doing this. Um, coming off of uh, 10 days in Israel and all that was bound up in that experience, uh, I will just give you a huge qualification to everything that I'm going to say tonight, everything that you're going to see in the, uh, in the photos, and it is that none of this will do justice to uh, what we actually got to experience there. Um, I mean, just time after time, I find myself taking pictures, getting panorama uh, shots of the land and the scenery, and I would look at my phone and go, oh, there's just no way that I can uh, capture the, uh, just what we saw as well as the impact of, of those moments. Um, if you are at all able, you have to visit the Holy Land. If you're at all able, you have to visit Israel. Um, and to make the most of that trip, just, just being there and, and getting to uh, go back and forth from what we were seeing, where we were, the sites that we visited, to uh, look again at text after text, and just feel the weight of the biblical text in a fresh way because of where we were standing or what we had just seen, where we had just come from, where we were going. Um, you've got to go with someone who believes the promises of God as they were given to Israel, to ethnic Israel, who believes in a future uh, for ethnic Israel and all of the land promises as the patriarchs, we would say, believe them. Uh, that element um, of just having someone who believes those things, who understands their eschatology, their end times, and can look back at past biblical history and then look forward, uh, and then to have those things just taught to us and articulated time after time was just unbelievable, really just no way I can accurately communicate to you the impact of those things. So if you can, that's my, my pitch and qualification for everything that you're going to see here. This just won't do it justice. You got to visit um, on your own. About probably 10 years ago, Daniel Faulkner and Kristen Faulkner went to Israel. They came back and Daniel told me, you got to start saving, do whatever you got to do to get there. And I, I shook my head and nodded, heard him, and then I went and thought, why didn't I listen? I should have done this years ago. So it was, it was truly an incredible trip and just an awesome privilege to uh, go the way that we did. Um, this is, is uh, our group. We had about 20 uh, seminary students from the Expositor Seminary. Um, Brian Farrell, who's the campus pastor at the Lynchburg campus, was leading the trip. He's been some 13 or 14 times. And so we spent the semester studying the geography of the land, uh, studying and reading about the geography. Um, those of us who audited that class and didn't take the quizzes probably would have benefited from not auditing the class, but the, really the seminarians were prepared to just know where we were, uh, what we were looking at, just from looking at maps over and over and over again. And then to actually be there, uh, we, we had some uh, perspective and were, were prepared well for that in the months leading up. So this is our group in the front, um, is this guy, Boaz, he was our uh, Hebrew tour guide, uh, and so he and Dr. Farrell have had this long established relationship as Dr. Farrell has been back and forth to the land. And uh, let me just tell you a little bit about Boaz. Uh, he was just such a, a pleasure to be around, just incredible man studied 
the history and geography of Israel as well as being a native. And so he brought all of his personal experience and study and Jewishness to bear on the trip. And that also was just, the, the trip wouldn't have been the same without that element. And so as a native, uh, he, he said he was a descendant of the tribe of Levi, is, is his heritage. And I don't think that I've seen before a person who so believes the biblical text and yet comes short of actual faith in what the Bible puts forward. Um, and he was upfront about that. I mean, he, he, uh, we, we know where he's at. Uh, he believes that Jesus is God, believes that he is Israel's Messiah, uh, believes the promises as given to the patriarchs, and yet the cost of following Christ, as Christ calls him, to actually embrace what God says about his own sinfulness, uh, his own bankruptcy when it comes to righteousness before God, uh, the cost of embracing those things, believing those things is just higher than he's willing to, to pay currently. And he and Dr. Farrell have had long conversations. He's been evangelized. He understands the gospel um, and will admit those things are true, and yet there is a, a real veil that lies over his eyes. If I can just remind you, if you open your Bibles to Second Corinthians, this is the very thing that Paul mourned about the, the Jews, even in his day, some almost 2,000 years ago. Look at 2 Corinthians 3.14, and this is really what we kept seeing over and over as we heard Boaz uh, and then saw other Jews throughout the trip talk about the biblical text, and we would agree with them on so much, and yet they still fall short of saving faith. Here's what Paul says, but their minds were hardened. For until this very day, talking about in Paul's own day, at the reading of the Old Covenant, the same veil remains unlifted because it is removed in Christ. But to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their heart. But whenever a person turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. So this is a real commentary on Boaz's life as well as many other Jews that we saw. Uh, here's another picture of Boaz. I mean, he, he basically, <laughs> he articulated so well what we would say about the biblical text. Somebody asked him at one point in our trip, uh, as he's talking about people who do not believe the Bible, uh, skeptics who have said there was no real figure, uh, no real king named David, uh, the there was no, no temple that once stood, and all of these uh, sites that we got to visit, all of these things that were uncovered that now bear witness to the truth of the scriptures, people who before these archaeological finds would deny the biblical text, and now they have these real-life artifacts to wrestle with. Someone asked, you know, what do, what do they say? And he articulated a, a biblical view of apologetics, of, of defending the faith or defending the text of Scripture, when he said, there's nothing you're going to do to convince someone who doesn't already believe the Scriptures. If you don't believe the Scriptures, then these archaeological finds that prove the Scriptures, people who are unbelieving are just going to find another excuse and say, well... Okay, that's true, but here's another reason why the biblical text isn't accurate. And, you know, he kind of went on this, this rant, got, kind of got on his soapbox about how crucial it is, even before you visit the land and all of these things are uncovered, that you have to actually believe what the scriptures say. And we would say amen to those things, and yet he doesn't believe the scriptures as delivered in such crucial ways. In this picture, he's actually standing 
we're, we're in Dan. So just, uh, I didn't include a map here, but if you, you can picture Israel, uh, which is really no bigger than Rhode Island currently. Um, so everything is in close proximity. We probably visited uh, five, six, seven sites a day at times. Um, we had a pretty small, nimble group, lots of young men on that trip. And so we, were, we, we would hike up a hill, hike up a mountain, hike back down, move to the next site, uh, hear a mini sermon preached by Dr. Farrell. He's just opening his Bible, telling us where we are, the significance. It's all hitting us. Boaz gives some history about the site, helps orient us to the geography, says, all right, you got 15 to 20 minutes, take pictures, look around a little bit, meet us back at the bus, we'll go to the next site. And so we got to move in pretty rapid pace. Here, he is at uh, Dan. So north, uh, you had Dan, was uh, sort of the northernmost part of Israel. Um, If you remember in 1 Kings 12, when the nation split under King Rehoboam after Solomon's death, King Rehoboam takes over the, uh, the land. And if you just turn there, I'll show you what's happening at that point in Israel's history. Rehoboam is the... Uh, foolish son of Solomon and has the uh, eventual justice against David and Solomon's sin carried out in his day when the nation is taken away from Rehoboam. And so he gets one tribe, which is Benjamin, in addition to Judah, and the other 10 tribes go to Jeroboam and bear the name Israel. So Jeroboam is fearful that people will actually go back to David, to the house of David, because they've got what in Judah? The temple, right? They've got the temple in Jerusalem. That's a part of the tribe of Judah. And so Benjamin and Judah have access to this glorious temple that Solomon built, Rehoboam, Uh, has that. Jeroboam doesn't. And so in fear, here's what he does. Look at uh, 1 Kings chapter 12, verse 28. So the king consulted and made two golden calves, and he said to them, it is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem, telling the remaining 10 tribes of Israel this. Behold your gods, O Israel, that brought you up from the land of uh, Egypt. He set one golden calf in Bethel and the other he put in Dan. And this would have been the southernmost part of the new boundaries of Israel. Uh, Bethel as well as the northernmost in Dan. And it says, now this thing became a sin for the, pe- for the people went to worship before the one as far as Dan. And so this is that place where we are. So behind Boaz, you can see uh, they've uncovered these ruins, um, found inscriptions and artifacts that would have located or told them that this was actually the place where Jeroboam built these calves or one of the place, one of these calves. And so what you're seeing there is uh, the ancient ruins from from this time, some of those, uh, some of the what you're looking at would have been original. Some uh, kind of re- reconstructed a little bit. And really, what the way they're finding these things, all of this is under dirt and civilizations that had conquered these lands would have built on top of the ruin. There's rubble. Fill it in with dirt. And then we're going to build a new city or whatever on top of it. And so that's what you get called uh, tells, like Tel Aviv, right? Tel Aviv is a, a tell. It's a, a place where the ancient ruins once sat and then new civilizations have built on top. 
And so the way they find what's underneath is they're actually digging through the dirt that the civilization following would have built on. Uh, Jerusalem has been conquered some 39 times in its history. And so you should find evidence of almost or, you know, somewhere between up, up, up to 39 different civilizations or evidence of the next nation that's conquered uh, that city. So the way they're finding these ancient places is they're digging through the dirt and then finding those ruins. Last picture of Boaz. He's pointing to a, another uh, building, these bricks. They were trying to find out why the, the random designs. Well, he's pointing to a, a sepulcher, um, this coffin that was inserted in the side of a building just used for brick, essentially. Uh, this is Dr. Farrell. Um, I think this is the, the picture where he's standing at the uh, precipice uh, point where in Luke 4, Jesus was, this was, he was attempted to be thrown off of uh, this precipice here. And you can see the valley behind him. And at each site, he's basically just doing this. He's, we're getting a lookout on the land and he's opening his uh, Bible on his iPad and telling us, okay, here's what happened biblically. Here's where you're standing. This is what you're looking at. Here's what took place at, at this place. And so we got these little mini sermons from, from Dr. Farrell at each of the locations. Uh, when we arrived, I don't know if this is going to going to play. Yeah, it's a video from the, from the plane when we first uh, flew in. We spent the first four nights in the city of Jerusalem. Uh, we, those of us from, uh, from Phoenix, got held up in Miami for uh, like 24 hours or something. So we got in a day late. We missed visiting the Temple Mount. Uh, we were supposed to go on uh, a Wednesday, I think and didn't get there until afterward. The Muslims control the Temple Mount. We'll, we'll look at that in a second, where the Dome of the Rock actually sits uh, since the 600s or so. And so the Muslims have controlled that, but that Temple Mount is actually obviously important to the Jews. And so the Jews provide the security the Muslims tell them when they can have access. In Jerusalem, uh, you can see the old city, not so well from here, but this is the, through our hotel balcony in the back, you can see old city Jerusalem. So this is the first night that we got in, uh, drove from Tel Aviv into Jerusalem, uh, kind of dropped our bags, and then uh, started touring the, the old city. So this is uh, the Western Wall, the first night. And obviously a, a popular tourist spot. We got to go into the, uh, underneath the Western Wall. So this is where we're, we're walking. <laughs> underneath, basically they've excavated those layers of the different civilizations that have conquered Jerusalem. And so there are, we got to walk underneath all of where we're standing, what you're looking at, uh, and see those previous civilizations. And when they uncover these things, they're looking at the architecture from a certain era. And so they can tell, okay, this layer belongs to this certain era. But here, Tons of tourists, and against the wall, you have lots of Jews who are praying, uh, reciting the Torah. Um, they've got just piles of uh, books where Jews will come and open up, read the Torah, or recite rabbinic prayers. 
And so this is kind of happening all the time at the, uh, the Western Wall that's actually suitable for, for the Jews to do this. Um, more Jews. Uh, there's Kyle. He's not praying or reciting the Torah. Um, there's a place where you can enter in right up against the wall. You can see a doorway in the back. And so underneath you go into that doorway and it kind of brings you inside, but still the, the Western wall is exposed and you have more of the same inside Jews uh, seated. They've got these tables that they're just sitting in front of, uh, some maybe for hours on end, quoting the, the Torah, memorizing the Torah, and praying. Um, there was one young guy who caught my attention. He was just adamant, fervently uh, reciting the Torah. And um, it was kind of sad to watch just thinking, you know, these unbelieving Jews who have our scriptures, uh, their own scriptures, and yet don't believe them. That veil uh, still lies over their, their eyes. And so this was, uh, you know, just as we walked around, I found myself praying for, for these Jews that God would actually open up their eyes to believe the scriptures that, that they're holding. Uh, something that has marked Israel for a long time, as you uh, well know, go to Romans 10, has been uh, self-righteous legalism. Paul grieved about this. This young man reminded me of, of Paul's words in Romans 10. Paul says, brethren, my heart's desire and my prayer to God for them is for their salvation. When's the last time you prayed, like Paul, for the salvation of the nation of Israel? If you believe the promises as promised, that salvation will one day come to Israel, God will give them a new heart, and every Jew, from the least to the greatest of them, will one day believe then you can pray in line with God's promises. Paul did. Verse 2, For I testify about them that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge, or but not in accordance with knowledge, for not knowing about God's righteousness, not because they weren't told, but a willful ignorance, and seeking to establish their own they did not subject themselves to the righteousness of God. They don't know about God's righteousness because they are willfully ignorant. They have the scriptures that tell them the law, and it is clear to anyone who's reading those words with a believing heart that the standard of the law is too high for any man to attain on his own. So he needs something outside of himself. He needs a righteousness that he can't accomplish. That's clear. We know that. You know that if you believe the gospel. And yet the Jews reading those words against all reason convince themselves that they can attain to God's standard of righteousness. That's not the scripture's fault that they believe this way. That's their fault. Just like it was our fault before we believed. Uh, there's a, the, we, we came into a, uh, a great example of this very passage. Rejecting the righteousness of God, Paul says, they seek to establish their own and they did not subject themselves to the righteousness of God as they saw God's righteousness without understanding it and sought to establish their own. Here's an example of this. On Shabbat, the Sabbath, that begins uh, Friday evening and extends to the last day of the week, uh, Saturday evening, everything shuts down in Jerusalem. So we got to be in Jerusalem at that time, and here is what we saw. I wish you had, um, is it, there's no way we can get volume on that, can we? This was just outside of our hotel. 
Let me start that over, if I can. Our bus driving away. What you're looking at is Jews after Sabbath has begun on Friday evening they are marching in protest of people driving on the Sabbath and I wish I had started recording sooner I mean you had men and children screaming at the top of their lungs. We, we didn't know what was going on at first. We had to be informed later. They are shouting, Sabbath, Sabbath. In protest, the people driving on the Sabbath or working, because that's considered work. So here these Jews are working really hard, exerting themselves in protest of people exerting themselves on the Sabbath. That's hypocrisy, and that's what legalism and self-righteousness will do. It will cause you to contradict the law as you seek to uphold it. This is the, the exact thing that the Pharisees did, is it, not, is it not? They washed, and they wanted to hurry up and have Jesus crucified. They wouldn't go all the way into uh, the the praetorium or wherever it was so that they didn't break the Sabbath. Um, they refused to take Judas's blood money because that was a violation. They couldn't accept that and, and receive that temple money. It was uh, money that was given to crucify an innocent man and they were the ones that gave it and wouldn't even take it back. I mean, and so this is the kind of hypocrisy that still exists to this day because of the blindness that exists over the minds of Jews. They cannot see that they are contradicting the righteousness of God as they seek to uphold it. Um, even uh, Boaz told us that the, the toilet paper is ripped in half because if you use that toilet paper on the Sabbath, then to, if you ripped it yourself, then that would be an act of creation which would go against or pervert the Sabbath because God did not work. He stopped creating on the seventh day. And so even ripping toilet paper in half is a, a no-go. Um, and it's super inconvenient to use that toilet paper. <laughs> um, this man, uh, Menno, is a faithful pastor of a real church, uh, mixed Jews and Gentiles, and so he sort of stands as what one day will be of, of the Jews. Um, this man has uh, just incredibly like-minded. It was so refreshing to hear him talk, and you know, we just asked him a question, and he would launch into uh, passage after passage that reveals Christ uh, and to talk about the ways that scripture reveals Christ uh, with our same hermeneutic. He reads his Bible the same way, uh, believes the promises of God the way that our church teaches. It was so refreshing. And to, to just hear about uh, his experience in church planting uh, in Jerusalem, uh, this man has been persecuted. His children and his family have been the objects of ridicule and scorn from other Jews. He has been blacklisted. People refuse to do business with him, um, to speak with him. He, he knows he's counted the cost of following Christ. And so it's just uh, so, so, uh, so refreshing to talk to him, get to hear about his uh, congregation, um, Jews and Gentiles in Jerusalem, dwelling together in unity uh, and, and functioning as the church uh, there. 
and to hear about the challenges and the, the joys that, that they get to experience. This is where they meet. Um, had a hard time locating a place, uh, a place that would even rent to them. And uh, he, in God's providence, grew up with somebody who is uh, one of the leading, uh, he leads one of the leading tourism organizations in Jerusalem. And so he was able to help them get into, into this place. Um, and, and this guy, you'll, you'll hopefully see some of Menno's books at our, our book table soon enough. Of course, I had to, to get the uh, Hebrew version of his Proverbs commentary. Uh, he, the, the name of that book, uh, Ma Shame Vama Shame Beno, uh, from Proverbs uh, 30. Who, what is his name and what is his son's name? And, and so he wrote a, a commentary on Proverbs. He said that that, book, that verse, in his opinion, is sort of the linchpin key text to understanding Proverbs. And so he uh, even some of us have already read, I think Ben and Smed have already read his book on Jesus in the Hebrew scriptures. And he just opens up passage after passage to see Christ in a, in a way that we would affirm. Uh, another significant aspect of this trip, uh, you can't see it too well. I'll zoom in in a second. But this is us standing on the Mount of Olives, just uh, or looking at the Temple Mount. So in the middle there, you have the, uh, the actual Temple Mount. Let me see if I can find a... Uh, here's a, a better shot of it. You can see the Dome of the Rock, that gold dome uh, where the Muslims worship and from there they blast Muslim prayers uh, across the entire city. It's an offense to the Jews but the Muslims have control of the, of the Temple Mount. That's the, the location of Solomon's Temple uh, once upon a time. And so there, this hill where the Dome of the Rock is situated would have been the same place uh, geographically where Abraham came and almost sacrificed Isaac, Mount Moriah. This is that location. Uh, the same location where David, after he numbered the people and God started uh, executing justice in the city uh, or amongst the people and came all the way up to this a uh, specific spot, the, the threshing floor that was there. David purchases it and then makes a sacrifice to God. And, and the angel of Yahweh stops uh, destroying the people. The plague ceases there. This is that same place. And then this is where Solomon, when he becomes king, he builds the temple. This is that same hill, Zion, as uh, it's often referred to in in scripture. This is where Ezra and Nehemiah, after the temple was destroyed in the exile, would have rebuilt the temple. And then you fast forward to the New Testament, Herod the Great, who exterminated the baby boys in Jesus' day. This is where he actually rebuilt, sort of gave an upgrade to the temple and that platform where you see on the left the, um, where the wall stops and you get the corner, that's the south and the east, eastern wall. Um, the south wall is that short one on the left side there. The eastern wall is the one that extends really far. Herod is the one who built the platform on which the temple sits. So Herod having... No love for the Jews, even though he was a Jew because of his family's history. Uh, the Jews, where his family was from, we got to even visit. The name of the place is escaping me, but he, uh, his uh, grandfather, I believe, was, they were told that they had to convert or be exiled. And because of the 
amount of property they owned, they chose conversion and, and circumcision you know, into Judaism, even though they hated the Jews uh, for presenting them with that kind of ultimatum. And so Herod comes along and he's born into Judaism as a Jew and yet has incredible animosity toward the Jewish people, doesn't care for their scriptures really, but that kind of accounts for the uh, double-mindedness that we see with Herod. He's got easy access when the wise men come looking for the king of Israel. So the scribes are at his disposal. He's the king. He's got scribes uh, in his possession and uh, doesn't mind committing mass murder of, of Jewish, Jewish families. But he, uh, everywhere we went, really, Herod leaves his fingerprints on everything, pretty much. Uh, he, after this trip, I have a much greater view of Herod. Um, I'll talk a little bit about this as, as uh, we look at how he left his, his mark on even the architecture. But this is one significant way, that platform on which the, the temple sat and now the Dome of the Rock sits. Uh, he expanded the area of the temple to be what we see now. I think it's something like 37 acres on which that sits. And so the, the actual dome is, is dwarfed by the entire platform, which is considered the Temple Mount. If we zoom back out a little bit, you can see up close graves of Jews that wanted to be buried in the city. <clears throat> Another indication that they took the promises of God literally when Messiah came, they wanted to be resurrected in the holy city. So that's why you have uh, those graves there, but those are actually um, really the graves of Jews that reject Jesus and are still looking, waiting, were waiting when they died for another Messiah. And so the resurrection that they're waiting on, or that actually happens, won't be the one that they were waiting on, unfortunately. That's uh, just pretty, pretty telling. Here's a, another view of the, the Temple Mount from, that's the eastern wall from the, the city view. If I can just direct your attention really quickly to Ezekiel 47. It was really fun to have been here and looking down at the temple from the Mount of Olives and have numerous passages that I've preached in the past, I guess, couple of years now and just bringing all of that to bear on what we were looking at. So Mount of Olives just east by the way, this is the Mount of Olives from where we're standing. We walked back down to the Temple Mount, basically, from, from this place. This would have been uh, less than a mile, kind of like if you left here right now and walked to Olive Garden on Elliot, that's the distance. So when it says Jesus went into the temple, looked around, and then leaves, and he goes back to the Mount of Olives, He's not like spending his whole day doing that. <laughs> it's just a really short walk uh, back and forth just to give you some perspective. But here's what's going to happen to what we're looking at right now. From the temple, we're standing east. And just look at what Ezekiel documents will be the case. Ezekiel 47 verse 1. Then he brought me back. So this angelic being, this man is showing Ezekiel around what will be the temple one day. Then he brought me back to the door of the house, and behold, water was flowing from under the threshold of the house toward the east, for the house faced east. So you have the eastern wall that we're looking at, 
same location, clearly a different day that Ezekiel's beholding, but east, this is the direction, okay? And water was flowing down from under, from the right side of the house, from south of the altar. He brought me out by way of the north gate and led me around on the outside of the outer gate by way of the gate that faces east. And behold, water was trickling from the south side. When the man went out toward the east with a line in his hand, he measured a thousand cubits and he led me through the water, water reaching the ankles. Again, he measured a thousand and led me through the water, water reaching the knees. Again, he measured a thousand and led me through the water, water reaching the loins. So it's getting deeper and deeper. Verse five, again, he measured a thousand and it was a river that I could not ford for the water had risen enough water to swim in a river that could not be forded. He said to me, son of man, have you seen this? Then he brought me back to the bank of the river. Now, when I had returned, behold, on the bank of the river, there were very many trees on the one side and on the other. Then he said to me, these waters go out toward the eastern region and go down into the Arabah. Then they go toward the sea, being made to flow into the sea. And the waters of the sea became fresh. So that's a reference to the Dead Sea. Out from Jerusalem, this river with its source from the altar in the temple flows eastward to the Dead Sea. Verse 9, it will come about that every living creature which swarms in every place where the river goes will live. And there will be very many fish for these waters go there and the others become fresh. So everything will live where the river goes and it will come about that fishermen will stand beside it from Engedi to Englaim. There will be a place for the spreading of nets. Their fish will be according to their kinds, like the fish of the great sea, very many, but its swamps and marshes will not become fresh. They will be left for salt by the river on its banks on the one side, on the other will grow all kinds of trees for food, etc. So you get the point there's a river coming out of the, uh, the temple, essentially. That's not there currently, as you can see. <laughs> one day that will be the case. And so we look for that future day. It's, it, was, it was fun to just think about, okay, where we're standing, there will be a river running somewhere past this to the Dead Sea behind us and then all the way forward, westward, uh, all the way to the Mediterranean uh, where we also got to stand. That day is, that day is coming. Here, just uh, below the Mount of Olives uh, is the uh, Garden of Gethsemane. And so here we got to walk around what are essentially 2,000-year-old trees on the Mount of Olives. Here's another shot. Um, you don't really get this, but just behind here, there's a, a Catholic church building. Um, those were like our least favorite places to be um, on lots of significant places. The Catholics have just built a cathedral. And so you walk, or walk in there and you can't really tell at most of these places what you're looking at. It's just lots of Catholic art and uh, architecture. And you kind of lose the, the sense of where you are because people are worshiping idols, you know, of the Catholic sort in those places. Here's an, a close-up of the, the Western Wall. This uh, is a brick on the wall, and what you're looking at is a ledge, and that is the way Herod the Great left his trademark on the architecture that he oversaw. He created basically a, a design that the stonemasons were obligated to utilize and so wherever you see bricks with that ledge, that uh, border around it, you know this is Herodian. And it's all over the place in Israel. Uh, there's a Hebrew inscription on one of these bricks uh, that 
has uh, some, some biblical language in it. Not really sure where, uh, what was the occasion for the inscription, but that's been left uh, a part of the wall. And all of this was, uh, this specific section was uncovered uh, just within the past several years, few years. And so there were people who denied that the Jews uh, even ever controlled the Temple Mount. Uh, There was a a pamphlet that Boaz said up until a few years ago, the Muslims just in, in, in small print at the bottom of this brochure that talked about the Dome of the Rock and how amazing it is. Basically, legend says that there was once a temple, a Jewish temple at this spot. You know, a, a Jewish legend says, or something like that. But when this was uncovered, underneath the dirt was this. This is a spot on the western side of the wall where the, the street had been destroyed because of blocks of stone from the top of the temple wall. So in 70 AD, when the Romans came in and destroyed the temple, the way Josephus describes that scene, how the Romans came in and actually pushed blocks of the the wall off the top of the wall, they found blocks that had collapsed the street from the distance that they had fallen. And so this became proof that the accounts of the Roman siege, uh, the destruction of Jerusalem, happened in that way. And so apparently the, the, the Muslims altered their, uh, their brochure. This uh, is another spot on the Western Wall. You can see that hole. Uh, the, the Muslims say that that is where Muhammad tied up his donkey in that hole and then ascended to heaven to speak with God and receive revelation. And so the Jews think it's uh, only a matter of time before they try and say we actually should have claim to the western side of the wall too. And so they're, they're thinking that those uh, legends have been fabricated so that they can lay claim to other sides of, of the Temple Mount, the Temple area. This is the south wall here, a close-up of the south wall. Uh, think Acts 2, Peter's sermon, is what happened here. Uh, here you have, uh, you can't see it too well in this picture. Here's a close-up. Uh, three gates, they've been closed in at this point, but this is where most of the traffic in and out of the, the temple uh, would have come. Uh, three entrances, three gates. You can kind of see them with the, the arches that have been filled in there, and here's a even closer picture of those places. And off to the side, just to the left of this, you would have had uh, another gate where that wall kind of enters into the building, that wall that is a newer wall that goes into an older gate. Here's a close-up of of that gate, so you can kind of see half of it still left. That would have been where those with some sort of infirmity, unable to travel as well, would have been allowed to come up. And the steps that we're sitting on, uh, they would have stopped and taken their time at each step, perhaps quoting the uh, Psalms of Ascent to get all the way into the temple. Here's a shot of um, the old and new steps. So on the left, that was, those are ruins uncovered. <laughs> so old steps in Jerusalem. Uh, this is leaving the temple area. And then you've got the new steps that have been built beside it, sort of their way of allowing traffic, but preserving the memory of what once was. 
This also happened while I was in Israel. <laughs> he likes to dress himself sometimes. Just a, has nothing to do with the picture, just a funny picture. Uh, nothing to do with the trip. Uh, so let me tell you about the, the, the food in Israel. We ate like kings. <laughs> I uh, have found out by trial and error, error that um, I shouldn't consume a ton of uh, bread. And so found this out really quick in seminary when we were exploring ways to stay awake longer. You know, how can I um, manage on three to four hours of sleep a night? And so we, I gave up bread and found out that was, that was the way. Well, in Israel, I was unaffected by their wheat. So whatever they're not putting in their wheat that we are is, is really good. So I kind of indulged and uh, made up for lost time in Israel. Here is um, the, the road to Jericho. So travelers would have uh, traveled from Jericho to Jerusalem, um, and they would have crossed here. Maybe you can't see it too well. Uh, black dots. There are people actually walking down there. So I'll zoom in a little bit. There's a, a monastery off to the left of center in the side of the mountain. But there are people walking down there, kind of touring, and they're actually traveling the road between Jericho and Jerusalem. So kind of an, an all-day deal, what they're doing. This was another favorite spot of mine, the aqueducts, uh, another relic from uh, Herod's day. He, he oversaw the construction of the aqueducts, um, several miles long, extending all the way from Mount Carmel, where Elijah and the prophets of Baal had the showdown on Mount Carmel, all the way to the Mediterranean Sea in Caesarea Philippi, where this port was these aqueducts. This is, these were just massive, uh, massive construction project. And you can see how, how big the, the rocks are, the, the stones that actually went into building these aqueducts. And essentially, gravity carried water from the top of Carmel all the way down into this port. And they provided water for, for everything that they could have possibly needed um, here at this port, the, the fresh water. This happened a number of times on the trip. It was a, sort of an indictment to me to think about pagans going through such diligent labor, to think that the will of one man essentially accomplished these architectural feats. Uh, time and time again, and I didn't include pictures of Masada or the Herodian. Um, hopefully, you know, maybe Steve will get to that next week, but one man with the will to say impossible is not an option. We're going to make this happen. Accomplish some of these architectural feats. Um, just thinking that an unbeliever with wrong motives and all the rest had the will to accomplish these things. Uh, and for me to think about lesser things, but of eternal significance, uh, reading, studying, things that would go into the labor behind teaching and preaching, to think, man, my will needs to match the, what I'm trying to accomplish. The growth of God's people, the uh, understanding of God's word, diligent search for wisdom, and all the discipline that that requires, uh, it's possible. And, and I need to have the will to go after those things. So that's why, the, uh, for me, the aqueduct was just a, a significant landmark to think of all the, the work, effort, labor that went into building something like this just to get water. How much more should I, as a Christian, as a pastor, as a preacher, uh, commit myself and yield all the resources that I have at my disposal to diligently labor over the text. 
One more, one more uh, place before we wrap up. <clears throat> uh, this is Mount Arbel. This is me on top of Mount Arbel. So just go to Matthew 28. Mount Arbel is not mentioned by name in the scriptures. But we are in <clears throat> Galilee. And let me just remind you, uh, in Matthew 28, verse 6, the angel says to the women, he is not here for he is risen just as he said. Come, see the place where he was lying. Verse 7, he tells them, go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead and behold, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. Uh, time and time again, in, just before we get to this moment, uh, and then again, Jesus says, tell my brethren to leave for Galilee, and there they will see me. And he mentions a mountain in Galilee. Well, this is really the only high place in Galilee, the, the highest peak in that region. And so by Matthew's account, Verse 16, the 11 disciples proceeded to Galilee to the mountain which Jesus has designated. This is that mountain, Mount Arbel. And what happens on this mountain, we read following. When they saw him, they worshiped him, but some were doubtful. And Jesus came up and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. This is my Arbel, a different shot. You can see the Sea of Galilee because <clears throat> this is where we are. Uh, and this overlooks, from this peak, you can see the Sea of Galilee. You can see the southern Judean cities. Uh, you can see where the Gentiles exist just on the other side of Samaria. And so the places that Jesus names as the disciples are hearing the Great Commission, probably later uh, on the Mount of Olives and hearing Jesus say, the kingdom's not now, the Father's fixed that time by his own authority. And so in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the uttermost ends of the land, ends of the earth, go and bring the gospel. Uh, we're able from just this single spot in Galilee to see those places, those regions. Um, and here's a, a panoramic shot. And so you just have cities, Judean, uh, Jerusalem would have been further uh, out in the distance. And then Samaria and Ju uh, Gentile places just to the left, you can't really see. But on the other side of the Sea of Galilee would have been the Gentile cities. And so the disciples being told by Jesus, being commissioned by him to go make disciples of all of these places would have had all of that available to them in one view, one shot. And so this was probably my uh, favorite place, just most impactful uh, place to be. And hearing Dr. Farrell describe what we were looking at, I just thought, I got to get back home and pack up and go to New Orleans. <laughs> for us, for me, for our team, that's the, the, the ends of the earth that we're supposed to go to. And so, loved being there. This was on the front end of our trip, and that was enough for me to say, okay, let's go. I could get on a plane right now and pack, and I'm ready to go. But that's not until October. <laughs> And so that time is fast approaching. We're eager for that. 
And uh, yeah, be, be praying for us um, as we think about New Orleans. Um, over the next few months, I'll be visiting partnering churches and raising support, and, and we're going. And October is coming quickly. <laughs> so let me, let me pray. God, thank you so much for, for your word that uh, gives us sufficient data, sufficient information. It's your voice. And so we have enough just in these pages to believe and to obey. Thank you for uh, entrusting your word to us, uh, giving us uh, such a remarkable treasure and then one that is affirmed time and time again by reality, by the real world. Uh, time and truth go together. This trip was a reminder of that. That even the things that have been discovered, markers that remind us of the truth of your scriptures, actually remind us of the reasonableness of faith for what is to come. All of your words will be proven true. Every word of God is tested. And so we just wait for your words to prove themselves in due time. And so before those times come, I pray that you would help us to believe you. Before the prophecies that you've marked out in your word come to pass, and even in our day-to-day lives, uh, your promises to us that you are good and you do good, that your word is trustworthy, that you're a merciful and gracious God, that you're slow to anger, that you abound in steadfast love toward those who fear you. I pray that all of these things that we would just believe because you are who you are, you are trustworthy. And God, those of us who have had the privilege of visiting the land, I pray that we would uh, continue to search out these things in your word and that the, what we've seen, that we would continue to, to let that spur us on to greater labor and greater faithfulness. And I pray that we would all be faithful together until we see the, the coming day when Jesus will one day faithfully reign as the long-awaited Messiah and King. I pray for Boaz and other Jews that you would finally lift the veil that remains over their hearts, over their minds to this day, and that you would produce a believing people, not for Israel's sake ultimately, but so that you might uphold your own faithfulness and justify, vindicate your own great name by saving the people that you've promised to save and bringing all of your promises to pass to them as you've given them. And we trust you to bring these things about in your own perfect time. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen.